Okay, hello everyone. This is Dr. Pruitt. Uh, today we're going to be talking about large vessel occlusion strokes. Most of you have likely seen this lecture in your day one EMS refresher. So first question is, what exactly is a stroke? The definition of it put simply, is that brain cells die when they don't get oxygen. And there's a couple ways that that happens. One is an ischemic event where blood flow is actually physically cut off. And another way is hemorrhagic where actually a blood vessel bursts and can no longer have its highway to deliver blood to the tissues. You'll see a ischemic stroke there on the left side of the screen and that's what brain starts to look like when it dies. It doesn't have that nice gray-white differentiation. The, the tissue just doesn't have oxygen and starts to die away and create an empty space. Whereas with a hemorrhagic stroke, these strokes usually get pretty bad pretty quickly because that blood occupies space in an otherwise relatively constricted skull and starts to push on the brain matter and move things around where things are not used to being and causes a lot of problems. So when we think about ischemic or thrombotic stroke, it's not that different from a heart attack where there's a blood clot in the brain in one of the arteries, and usually it's a diseased artery, and a clot breaks off and goes to the smallest part and causes an obstruction of blood flow. Now, risk factors for this include smoking, hypertension, high cholesterol, and diabetes. And the more of those problems you have, the higher risk you are. So that's why it's important for people to, one, not smoke, and two, control their cholesterol and blood pressure and their blood sugar as well. Some of these patients who experience an ischemic stroke might have a history of TIAs and basically TIAs are warning that these vessels are not that healthy and have impending bad pathology. So it's important if the patient is reporting symptoms that come and go, they still need to get quickly to a stroke center to have that evaluated because a lot of the times these TIAs are precursors to large strokes. There's another cause for a stroke that's called embolic stroke. And it's the same thing where a clot comes through a vessel and goes and lodges in a very distal, small part of a vessel in the brain. And a lot of times these come from the heart. They can be fairly sudden in onset. They might resolve with time, but not always. And one of the biggest risk factors for these is atrial fibrillation. If the heart is not pumping effectively, blood can pool in either the left atrium or the left ventricle. And as blood pools, we all know it starts to clot. And as the left ventricle pushes those clots out, one of the first places it can go is to the brain. Now, another patient population who's at risk for this would be a uh, IV drug user population who don't usually get atrial fibrillation, but they get vegetations in their heart from infectious diseases that are caused by the needles that they use. And so a lot of times, it's little pockets of infection that can be launched to the brain and cause a stroke there as well. As always, risk factors for strokes include high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and diabetes. One of the things we really need to think about in the pre-hospital setting is the risk of cardioversion to our patients. If we have an unstable patient who's in atrial fibrillation with RVR, say, and we decide to cardiovert them, remember that AFib is one of those precursors to embolic stroke. And so we really have to weigh the risk and the benefit when we're cardioverting someone of how long they've been in this AFib and whether they're anticoagulated and whether or not we think it's safe to convert them by using that electricity, because if we do, there's a chance we might um, cause an embolic stroke. And this isn't just a pre-hospital consideration. I promise it's a, it's a very heavy decision that we make in the hospital all the time as well, the cost versus benefit with these unstable patients and cardioversion. Another form of stroke is intracerebral hemorrhage, and this usually has a gradual progression over minutes to hours. And like we talked about earlier, this occupies a lot of space and tends to make patients very, very sick because there's not a lot of room for swelling or extra space in that tight skull. So risks for this, again, would be hypertension. Sometimes tumors. If you have patients with known brain tumors, brain tumors really have a propensity to bleed. So I would have a high suspicion of brain bleed in your, in your um, cancer patients who present with a sudden headache and altered mental status. Trauma can cause this as well. 
and drugs like cocaine and meth usually lead to hypertension and sometimes the blood pressure can get so high that literally blood vessels burst in the brain. There's also um, a genetic risk factor for vascular malformations that can cause intracerebral hemorrhages as well. Usually these patients will present with rapidly declining mental status, whereas your thrombotic or embolic strokes, they'll have deficits that stay pretty steady throughout your entire transport. Head bleeds tend to just get worse and worse and worse on your way to the hospital in terms of mental status and neurological exam. Subarachnoid hemorrhage is another one we need to talk about when we're thinking about stroke. This is usually an abrupt, sudden onset of the worst headache of my life, is what all the textbooks tend to say. Severe headache. It can be precipitated by sex or intense physical activity. Usually there's no focal findings associated with it other than just a terrible headache and sometimes some nuchal rigidity because that blood that's there in that subarachnoid space is very, very irritating to the meninges and makes people not want to move their neck very much. There's a hereditary risk for this, can be caused by an aneurysm. Again, smoking and high blood pressure are not good things and drugs can cause it as well. Decreased alertness is something to look for but is not always present in these subarachnoid hemorrhages. Now when we think about the brain, we all know that structure and function go together. So the front part of the brain is that pink part over on the left side of your screen and that's the part that controls our personality and as you get closer to the core of the brain there's the more essential functions of maintaining life that get towards the middle so in that purple part you'll see purple and uh, brown part there in the cerebellum our blood pressure our respiratory rate our basic functions of life are dictated and controlled more uh, centrally in the brain and of course, for all of those functions that the brain does, that is all dictated by blood supply. And one of the most important things about the brain is that little circle right there in the middle. It's called the circle of Willis. So you have, we know that there's three branches that come off of the aorta when the aorta is pumping blood to the body. And essentially that ends up in two big vessels in the front of the neck called the carotid arteries, which feed the feed the brain on the left and the right and then there's two arteries in the back which are the vertebral arteries that go through your cervical spine and they feed the posterior circulation. Those four big arteries all meet in the middle in the circle of Willis and then branch out from there to go to the distant parts of the brain and supply the um, different functions out there. So when we look a little bit closer at the circle of Willis, as you have your vertebral arteries coming through the um, cervical spine, they merge into a basilar artery that goes into the circle that we talked about. You have some internal carotid arteries here and then smaller arteries elsewhere. The ones we want to focus on are the ones that supply the biggest territories. So if you look at this big yellow piece of the brain right here, that's the territory that's supplied by the mid middle cerebral artery. And that's a branch of the internal carotid, and it's obviously a majority of the brain. And if you think back to that slide that we saw earlier, this is the part of the brain that controls speech. It controls sensation in the arms and the legs. It controls movement in the arms and the legs, and a lot of other functions in the brain as well. It's a major artery that dictates major functions in the body. So it's very important. And if we just take one more look at it, again, the yellow pieces of this brain as we break up the brain in terms of structure and function, look at that yellow piece there. That's the territory that the middle cerebral artery feeds. And look at the functions that it does. It controls the tongue, the face, the hands, um, a little bit of the legs and a lot of speech. There's motor and sensory components there. And so who cares? Why is this important? Well, stroke is the leading cause of long-term disability in the world. If you look at these two pathological samples of brains here, the one on the left is a um, thrombotic or embolic infarction where that brain is 
relatively, it's a relatively new infarction and you see a lot of swelling and you see a lot of um, tissue that looks like it's starting to die. It's discolored and starting to get edematous. Um, and you can see that it's kind of pushing over everything over towards the patient's left. That's likely a brain that herniated from a stroke. And you look over at the picture on the right, this is an old stroke, and it basically involved the entire right hemisphere. And this patient must have survived for a while after the stroke because there was time for all of that dead brain tissue to resorb, but I can only imagine what their neurological function was like after that stroke. The reason this is important to us is that we know strokes cause a large amount of morbidity and mortality in our population. And we now have an ability to go in and intervene on these strokes where we didn't have maybe over the last 10 years. And remember when we were talking about that middle cerebral artery and all the territory that it supplies in the brain and all the major functions that it controls with its blood supply? 65% of our big bad strokes are caused by a stroke in that artery. Whereas when we talk about the other major arteries, either the internal carotid or the basilar, they account for another um, significant proportion of our big strokes. But a lot of these strokes are in large vessels, and now we're able to intervene on them. The intervention that is relatively new and that's important for us is called thrombectomy. And basically, it's just a stent for the brain, a vessel that's occluded. We now have the ability to go in and pull it out. So there's been a lot of trials over the last several years to see which is best for these large vessel occlusions. And all of these five trials with their very clever names were published in the New England Journal of Medicine in a head-to-head -head comparison in 2015. And they were looking and comparing at 90-day neurological outcomes. And what they were comparing is patients who got thrombectomy where the clot was actually removed with just routine stroke care. So if you look at the Mr. Clean trial, 33% of patients were better at 90 days as, compo as compared to 20 with just routine care. Escape trial looked even better. Extend trial, even better. Trial after trial after trial has confirmed that thrombectomy is a much better treatment for these large vessel strokes than what we were doing before. And it's proven to be safe. If you, the outcomes are better, but if you look over at the right-hand column where the death rates are, um, we're also preventing death by doing thrombectomies as well. Um, if you look at the escape trial, the death rate, it's almost um, cut in half. Same thing with extend trial, even better. Um, so we know that it's safe and we know that it's effective, and more and more hospitals are going to start to do it. And this is just another way of looking at basically the same data and comparing the conclusions of studies that have been done for large vessel occlusions. So if you look at the different trials, the, the red columns there will show you the percentage of patients who um, received functional independence after they underwent thrombectomy compared to patients who didn't get a thrombectomy and had some functional independence after their stroke. And it's pretty clear that the numbers are much better if you get a vascular intervention. And this is just another way at looking at one of the trials. I really like this slide because it has um, such, a, such a clear depiction of the effect on mortality here. If you look at the left where patients received medical treatment only and didn't get any va endovascular treatment, 19% of those patients died and 52% of them ended up with pretty severe disability. Whereas the ones with the exact same stroke in the exact same location who got endovascular treatment, 53% of those patients had a positive outcomes and not as much disability, and the death rate was almost cut in half. And personally, I think that's pretty remarkable. So how does it work? Well, basically, if you look at the shot on the left before thrombectomy, you can see where that red arrow is. There's an abrupt cutoff of blood flow there as the vessel turns off to the left. And what happens after they go in with the uh, fluoroscopy and the ability to place a stent, on the right you can see where the exact same vessel where the arrow was with the occlusion, they pull the clot out using the thrombectomy procedure and are able to restore blood flow to that part of the brain. 
And if we look a little bit closer at the way that it works, the surgeons, just like you would with a cardiac stent, you can access one of the arteries either through the groin most commonly or through the radial artery in the wrist and insert a wire, put a stent in, and then eventually pull the clot back out. And this is what it looks like when the clot is retrieved. So what are the risks of this procedure? Obviously, when you're sending wires and stents into a vessel that's um, not getting enough oxygen, there's a risk for hemorrhage because the walls of that vessel might be a little irritated. It's a 5% risk for that. You can also, as you're sending wires in, cause little emboli to be launched even further into the vessels and cause a, another stroke further down the line. Vessels can dissect. They can have a spasm. Um, happens, happens, but rarely. And then anytime you're inserting foreign bodies into the body, there's a chance of either bleeding or infection. So how are we going to recognize an elbow stroke from the field? As always, we're going to continue to do the Cincinnati Pre-Hospital Stroke Scale. So we're going to evaluate patients for facial droop, for arm drift, and for abnormal speech patterns. If the patient is positive on the Cincinnati scale, then we're going to move on to what's called the Los Angeles Motor Scale. This is the LAMS test. And Basically what this is going to do, again, you're looking at the face and the arms and the grip, and you're going to give the patient a score. So when you're looking at the face, they get zero points if both sides move normally, and one side and one point if um, they have some facial droop or one side is weak. When you're considering the arms, you get a point if one side is weak, but you get two points if one side is completely not moving at all. Same thing with grip, when you evaluate the hand strength. One point if it's weaker than the other side, but two if, you, if they can't move that hand at all. You give them a total on a five point scale. And if they have greater than a score of four, in addition to a positive Cincinnati, then that's gonna count as an elbow stroke and we're gonna take them directly to a thrombectomy capable hospital. Essentially, I know this is a lot of scales and things to learn and scoring that needs to be done. But really, your patient is going to look like they're having the big bad stroke. They're going to have facial droop. They're going to likely not be able to speak, likely not be able to move one side. These strokes are not going to be subtle. So now that you've identified this big bad stroke, what are you going to do? Well, I know you realize that the clock is ticking. With any time there's tissue that's not getting blood flow, time is of the essence. So the probability of a good outcome is decreased by 10% for every 30 minutes that these patients go without intervention. That's almost 2 million neurons that are lost each minute that they don't get restored blood flow. So from the scene, you're going to want to issue a stroke alert or an elbow alert as soon as you possibly can. And then you're going to want to keep your scene time less than 15 minutes. Remember, even though you're trying to optimize your scene time, a patient history is going to be critically important for the decision makers at the hospital. So it's very key to get a last known normal time because that's going to dictate treatment. So whoever is there with the patient, whoever called 911, whoever saw them last, it's important to know a time when they were last at their baseline. And it will also help the hospital out while you're there if you can get a contact number for that family member or take them with you so they can provide supplemental history as they're determining the best treatment for this patient. And then, again, as always, get a thorough medical history and obtain a medication list. Especially important will be anticoagulation drugs to help um, further treatment at the hospital. So what can we do en route for these patients? Always, always, always check a blood sugar in your stroke patients because hypoglycemia can mimic stroke. Many people have been fooled over the years. A 12-lead EKG will be important, um, especially the big question there is, in the, are they in atrial fibrillation or not? We talked about earlier that's a, a leading cause of stroke, so get that 12-lead, answer that question. Avoid hypoxia. As that brain tissue is starting to die, we know that hypoxia is terrible for head injuries. So 
if the patient isn't able to maintain on their own an oxygen saturation above 90, go ahead and give them supplemental oxygen. And avoid hypotension as well. We still need to keep that blood flowing to the head. So you can try small fluid boluses and continually reassess if you need to. And make sure you're always getting a good patient history. Now the ELVO radio alert. You can do this the minute you recognize you have an ELVO patient. Um, from scene, it doesn't have to be the rescue lieutenant, but let AAS base know that there you have a patient with an ELVO alert, Cincinnati positive with their LAM score. Make sure you say their age and their sex, their last known normal, what exactly their symptoms are, and include a blood sugar and vital signs. It's just the same as STEMI trauma or sepsis alerts to the hospital. They're going to want to be getting that team ready to set up for an intervention. And the more of a heads up we can give them, the more time that gives them to get their team ready and speed up that patient's intervention. Now, as of today, when we're recording this, the only hospital in the city that's able to do this 24 hours a day, seven days a week, is the university. Now, both Loveless and Presbyterian are working on building up their capabilities, so there will be more to follow on that. Loveless right now is doing some internal thrombectomies, as is Presbyterian. Um, Loveless is reporting that they're 24-7 capable, and Presbyterian is mostly Monday through Friday, 8 to 5. For now, the stroke guideline is being discussed at the Medical Control Board, and destination decisions will deter be determined at the outcome of that meeting. So um, more will come in July. For right now, it's just important that you are able to do that Cincinnati testing and the follow-on LAMS testing and recognize elbows. Get familiar with that testing process. And for now, the only hospital that's taking these patients is UNM. And if there's any questions, please feel free to ask or email me or your 7-8 for further information. Thank you.